Hello, everybody, and welcome to Between Two Fans. And it is one very happy fan, one kind of lukewarm happy fan in terms of the sporting results over the weekend. But Springboks won, so life is always good. And uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about in this episode on the back of an incredibly busy sporting weekend. Rugby Championship back. Curry Cup coming to the business end of the competition. The Premier League really started to now heat up uh, just in time to go into the international break. We've already had that weird, awkward sort of three-week uh, period. Uh, not too much cricket at the moment happening. Um, a lot of our South Africans sort of playing in around uh, in the CPL. There's an SAA tour we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, but the Paralympics very much dominating our screens at the moment. And we have got two medals to talk about, including a gold. So exciting times. And I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Dan Scholes. Dan, how are you Steve very very good thank you I think we should first address concerns about the um the shirt that I'm wearing and that it's not um I guess it's controversial as many thought but uh, it's in the works and and next week yeah there is um my punishment of wearing a shirt of Steve's choosing um will be revealed it is just um it's taking some time to get you let's call it that um so um i'm not excited for that but i was absolutely thrilled by this last weekend's sporting achievements from a south african and premier league perspective but let's get right into it and we'll start off with the last week's prediction steve how about that mm. Yeah, we can. We can. Uh, pretty close, to be fair, by, by the one. I was actually saying, we almost need to take a, we need to start taking out like the 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 like the Liverpool Manchester Man United prediction because it's just so like and like a Western Province versus Lions. <laughs> just it it's just you, so, bro. huh? Just because it hurts you? No, not really. It's hurt you in the past as well, as well. To be fair, um, when it yeah, comes had, to like the Stormers, I've um, had a couple, it, um, a couple FA Cup ones that have you know come to bite. Yeah. Me. Yeah, it's just it's too emotional, you know. We and it, we've we, we're basically going against our knowledge, um, quite deliberately from a from a from a heart of a mind perspective. So, yeah, but I wanted to add that disclaimer that um, yeah. when it comes to that, you know, these are our teams, and don't listen to anything when it comes to those teams because we actually don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's it's always been hard to overhead here um, between these two fans, at least. Um, but at least our hearts were on the right side of the box versus AB's prediction, Stevie. So starting yeah. off with that one, obviously that ended 31 points to 27, a margin of four. Um, and it was really split down the middle. I had a prediction mm. of two, you had a prediction of seven. So nothing between us. I think we were both pretty pretty bang on the nose there. Um, expected a tight game. Um, yeah. Or, I mean, it was a try right at the end that really clinched it. So I actually just needed Sasha to miss one off the tee, and I would have been. Well, the I want to. I mean, on, on a point of order, he was timed out of a kick despite the All Blacks having already broken their line. Yes. So exactly. you know, on on a point of order, I'd like to. I, I might be submitting a complaint to World Rugby on this. Um, sure, and that kind of saved just, my bacon. Yeah, literally. Um, not to mention the All Blacks trial, which apparently should have been ruled out, and the Street Mox trial, which apparently the Mogul Game on apparently should actually stand. All very controversial. We'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, but we're yes. gonna get we're gonna get into all of that. Um but then of course it was that United versus Liverpool game ending as I can't wait to reveal. Three nil to Liverpool, away from home, at the theatre of dreams, becoming the theater of tears at this point in time but that's hey, not even hey, just because we leak yeah that's not even because of the, the leaking yeah. roof and as we move my prediction was a 2-1 2-0 liverpool win yields with a 2-1 united win so i've taken the lead in that one stevie and I'm, I'm so sorry to reveal that one to you but um unfortunately the ten hog nightmare continues um but then we go over onto the final prediction and it was Bulls versus Lions. And that ended uh, as you were at the game, Stevie. Um, I was at the game. I was freezing my ass off, <laughs> but I was at the game. Yeah, lucky you. But that, and, and lucky you because, I mean, Lions with a blowout win, 57 points to 33. Um, clearly, they actually enjoy playing in front of fans, which they don't get to do um, very often. But 
our predictions were, let's say, not very close. Um, but as we've often said, it's not about getting it right. It's about getting it less wrong. So my prediction yes, of lines correct. by two and yours by lines by five were, were well off the mark. Um, Look, in, 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 I think, both of our defenses, we didn't know that the lines were going to use this as a URC one game. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to, to the point where they named their entire URC team and the URC coaching staff. They literally took the Curry Cup step and said, <laughs> Oaks, love the work, love the work. Yoast take a week off. We should have quickly have a quick run out here and then Yoast can come back in for the Curry Cup closing stages. I was just like, oh, to be, to be able to play in front of fans, yes, come on. <laughs> All the boys, get back in. You know, this isn't now just, you know, so, uh, uh, you know second string Curry Cup game. Let's, let's get involved here. So... You've tied that up. It's 1-1. And essentially, we remain at 0-0 now that is the new stretch. And we are obviously condensing this. We're no longer going to 15 because that took forever. We're going to 5 and then the next person. There might be the same um, the same forfeit of wearing a shirt um, of the other fans choosing. Or if you come up with your own forfeits, let us yeah. know. Yeah, we, we, we need some ideas for forfeits. We need a bit of variation to these things. Yeah, and and you'll see you'll see my um the face that I'm wearing and the shirt that I'm wearing next week um and that that'll that'll show you I think how how poor um and disappointed I am to have lost the first round. But Stevie, let's jump now straight into the rugby championship and let's start off with obviously the massive one, the biggest rugby game of the year and the biggest rugby fixture that there is in the world: South Africa versus yeah. New Zealand at Ellis Park. It's just everything you I'd like to be edited to be rugby heritage and it was it lived up to the height right 31 points to 27 spring box winning um not without its controversy though yeah look i mean and from the occasion from all accounts you know despite that little bit of a mishap when it came to the end of the hucker and the plane flying over etc etc but all accounts uh, an incredible day out um i've heard so many good things apparently the atmosphere was phenomenal the the new zealand media was saying that they people don't understand how unique it is they said that you don't get atmospheres like that in new zealand you just don't um and and you know they said that you know the apparently the bus system worked really well apparently the there's a lot of security apparently a couple of issues with the road closures but um the actual security the vibe around the stadium apparently people felt a lot better that you know they had the instant two years ago when we had that game where you know there was a lot of crime stuff happening outside apparently the they really upped the ante with regards to the organizational and security part and you know access to the stadium so uh, two years ago, I think, you know, I'd, I'd wondered if we had might have seen, a, a, you know, the last game in a long time at Ellis Park because of the issues they had. Um, but it sounds like they really did take their lessons from there and um, learn from them. So a phenomenal occasion and then a match to 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 uh, worthy of it. Uh, and maybe not the most. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because some people are talking about, you know, it wasn't the best game in terms of, you know, quite a few errors, for example, lots of penalties from a new perspective. But I mean, you look at a game like that, four points in it, coming from behind, you know, all the drama. This is this is the kind of game you want, you know. I don't need to watch a very clean, um, you know, no, no errors, you know, forty-five to ten victory. You know, I want to watch yeah. a game which has the, you know, the the small moments and it does kind of ebb and flow and stuff like that. So it's exactly for me what Tez Rugby should be like. Yeah, exactly. And I think it we've become used to seeing almost lawless games like these in recent times so you think back to almost the france from france south africa game the new zealand ireland game both at the world cup and the world cup then our world cup final with new zealand then our tests with ireland they they mm. remind me of games that i don't really remember one team making a lot of mistakes where it felt like in this game there were actually quite a few mistakes yeah. being made but from both sides and which made it that frustration like kind of trying to pull your hair out um scenarios and yeah i mean i was certain that the box were on to um going on to lose that one it just looked like it was written in the stars just mistake after mistake and we felt like we weren't getting um some of the calls particularly in the in the first half um but managed to get out on top and win is win so that is that is all done but let's jump into the two big tmo decisions and i first want to start and i hear your opinion because i haven't heard it yet on the bongi and bonambi try are you saying try or no try so it's an interesting one because yesterday i was doing the i did my live show and we kind of looked at it and you know, it's such an interesting one. So uh, Jared Wright, on, on his, who, who writes for Planet Rugby, he apparently did a whole deep dive 
Uh, and there's a whole like flow chart, for example, when it comes to these kind of things. Um, and you know, does he lose control? You know, is there separation? Is it forward, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, and apparently, had his work checked by an independent, uh, an elite level a referee at the moment. Um, and according to that, they reckon the try should stand um, because it was basically backwards, dislodged by uh, Jordy Barrett, never travelled forward um, out of the hands, for example, of Bongi Manambi on his own. Um, will, for example, and there was grounding, and therefore the trial should stand. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting one. You know, for, you know, when I initially thought, I thought it probably shouldn't have been a trial. I thought, even when I was looking yesterday, you know, yeah, the the only thing I'm saying to him is the fact that that, that the argument that that Jordy Barrett knocks it out of his hands, for example, and it's backwards, I suppose, off of Jordy Barrett rather than forwards off of him, because there is for me, I think there is slightly separation. I think it does travel a bit forward, but I think the fact that obviously it gets knocked out of his hands or knocked backwards. You know that's probably what what would say isn't. So according to that analysis, apparently apparently it is a try. Um, I don't think I wouldn't have been sitting there up in arms if they had looked at it very quickly afterwards and said no, it was a knock on and, and the trial wasn't yeah. awarded. For example, yeah, I obviously everyone only saw the separation in the replay, and I was actually one of the only people that was saying no, it's still a try. And in the moment, to say because my thought is is that on any other part of the field, if that happens and you look into it, with, um, it's a knock-on from Geordie Barrett, mm. and that's what you, you replace South Africa scrum. But often in other parts of the field, you wouldn't have the time to actually go back to see that it was Geordie Barrett who knocked it on. So generally, it's actually called the Bongi and would not be knock-on, you know, because you, you, you don't really get to, you wouldn't look at a knock-on with a TMO review, right? But I think, for me, the hard facts is that Jordy Barrett's hand knocks it out backwards into Bongi's chest. The ball goes down onto the ground, and then Bongi um, force places it on the ground. So for me, I thought it was a try at the time, but I can understand, like, as you said, nine times out of ten, they probably aren't given you don't see them very often. But then obviously the big one, of course, and was on the other end of the park, and I guess it made it perhaps somewhat equal that it feels like it happened to both teams. But the mall try from New Zealand mm. um, with a with the, also supposedly another error um, from the referee. Yeah, it's. I mean, that for me, I think, is, is quite clearly not a try. Uh, I think it's far easier to to look at it in terms of what we call double banking. A lot of people talk about, oh, I've never heard of this. Well, it's just the phrase that we use that some people tend to use to explain it. But it, it is very clearly obstruction. Um, mm. You can see that it's to a low mass gets in front of Artie Sevier and uh, Artie Sevier never takes the first sort of contact in, in the mall. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that I think was pretty clearly not a, not a try. Um, probably far easier to, um, yeah, like to award. Sad. Um, and I think the main one. frustration, even with the first thing, is it just never felt like the TMOs were looking at it. You know, some people are saying, no, 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 the TMO had decisions. looked at, you know, they're assuming that the TMO had looked at the Bongi number one and it had no issue. All it takes is Andrew Bray saying, um, the TMO has checked it and he's, and he's happy with it. That's all you have to say. You know, just yeah. that one sentence just to just allay all fears that it has been looked at and it's been cleared. Yeah, you know, um, and I think, and I think we didn't get that sort of confirmation either in the second try, where see, yeah. we went to the referee and said, "Is that not obstruction?" And yeah. uh, the referee waved him away. And again, there was no like, "Listen, see, I've asked the Timo has looked at it and he's happy with it." You know, I think that's then, where the frustration yeah. is coming. You know, even with the exactly. sad came where apparently they had looked at it. You know, it just didn't feel like they'd had that given either of the incidents, the the time it required. And they are trying to speed up the play, and they are trying to make sure that ball and play is is you know incredibly mm -hmm. important. But it just feels that we're not getting the communication that it has been clearly looked at, that it has been reviewed, and has been um, you know uh, assessed and a decision has been made. And I think exactly. that my, I always judge a referee so much on their communication. Uh, yeah. Just in general, you know, if, if they always make mistakes, and you know, whether they're making bad calls or good calls, you know, a lot of that, even that itself, can be subjective. But I, for me, I look at a referee about communication. Are they clearly communicating to the captains, to the teams? Are they making their decisions very clear? Because then you understand what's being officiated, what's been looked at, and why decisions are being made. And I think when we don't have that clarity, and we don't have, you know, those those um, the communication being uh, um, shared with us, then that's where the issue comes. Because now, as far as we're concerned, we think that the team maybe hasn't even looked at it. And has noticed it, um, yeah. whereas we just we just need that confirmation that it has been looked at. I just think so. Rugby is going through a couple of growing pains at the moment, and there are two competing factors. One is that everyone has preached that the game has to 
be much faster. And everyone's, be, you know, there was a big push for ball and play, for example. So now you're looking at that juxtaposed with getting the right type of decision out there. You don't want to see that scenario that we had in the British Knives Lions tour where, you know, one half of rugby takes over an hour because I think that's like the wrong end of the spectrum. But now we have competing factors where if you look at that first Bongi try, now because he didn't actually go look at it when after the replay had been showed, and now so there it's like he's trying to speed up the game. So maybe that's why that's in the back of his mind. He, he needs to keep the ante up, so he mm-hmm. hasn't gone to go look at it. And then as a result, um, New Zealand are complaining. Sasha's clock, he thinks maybe it stopped because they've broken the line, and now Sasha yeah. misses the, the shot clock and misses two points. If Springboks lose that game by one point, I think there's a lot more frustration in, in that decision. And it's just because I think on one hand, the referee's been told you've got to hurry it up, and now potentially he's brushing over these points where you just need to be speaking. And then, you know, just like you do in the rugby game, you know, time off while there's an injury, time off while I'm checking. Um, this decision for shot clock as well. Um, I mean, they've already brought down the penalty shot clock down to one minute. So it's it's being it's always being they're just these competing factors for time that are that are kind of pulling it in two different directions. Yeah, because the problem is again that they, they, at the end of the day they did they were walking towards Sasha before he had started his motion quite clearly because they were asking the referee to have a look, which meant that he, that the clock should have reset and he should have had another you know a six seconds to to have taken it so that and i'm whether he would have gotten it or not you know we don't know but it's just frustrating because that definitely played a part and you know he even mentioned the fact that they're well they're busy walking up here and what's going on and it was a bit chaotic so yeah. you just need to take a bit more control i think um i think also frustratingly a lot of the fans you know it, it seems to have been a big uh, disconnect uh, literally a, a, a non synchronization of the shot clock that the referees were using versus what we were seeing on the broadcast which for me is a pretty easy fix and you've got to fix that because now yeah. you've got all, every single team TV fan has watched Damien McKenzie slot a kick well after, well after the, the clock has gone down to zero and it's been allowed. And you're sitting there saying, well, why, why have we got a clock? So you either have to not show it on the broadcast um, and assume that it's within the time as per the referee, or if you show it on the broadcast, you have to make sure it's aligned because that was being also an issue. Um, yeah. The fact that the shot clocks weren't aligning, aligning and now people are saying, well, why was he allowed to kick that? Yeah, no, agreed. And Stevie, a bit of a lack of um, all black bomb squad we've got mm. a stat now for the last three games and essentially this whole rugby championship no tries in the last 20 minutes um in their last three games so not being able to either close out their lead or make sure that they are closing out the game once they have that lead um what do you take into that is it the inexperience that they have um because there have been a, a couple retirees and I think the biggest ones for me come to mind, obviously, Retallick and Whitelock. You know, that's just the, the core of that forward pack. But is that just inexperience that they don't have and we do? Yeah, I think I think it is a big change in depth. You know, we now the Springbok side is so 23-man driven now. It is not a 50-man a game and then their replacements, you know, and it's not a case. And this is what drives me at the wall. People are still sitting there saying, you know, what does... Um, the comment was, what does what Grant Williams have to do more to do to start? And you're sitting there going, Malcolm Marks is probably the best hooker in the world mm. on his day. Um, and that's very, really not his day. And yet he comes, to, he periodically comes off the bench. You mm. know, are you going to sit there and say, Bongi Benami is a better player than him? No, no one's going to sit there and say that. But yeah. people should come off different roles. So it's a similar kind of vibe. And I think the problem with that is that New Zealand don't have, the, currently don't have the depth to be able to do that. There is a marked drop-off between the starters and the replacements. And there are injuries, you know. Um, you know, at the moment, for example, Ethan DeGroote not being there, I think is a big um, drop-off there. So I think it's Marty Williams, who, who didn't play terribly, but I think if he's coming off the bench a bit better. I think, you know, uh, Summer Sony Takawawa, for example, is obviously injured. Um, so they do have quite a few injuries, but I think they and I think the timing of the All Blacks um, substitutions kind of indicate that as well. You know, they really don't want to go to their bench, um, which yeah. you, you can kind of see why, because it's statistically they're just not competing. Uh, so yeah. there's definitely seems to be a marked drop off. Now it's an interesting thing. You know, people talking about does that mean they need to go to a six-two split and try and add an extra forward to try and nullify? Uh, you know, maybe because they don't have the the quality that they need to try and add an extra player to try and cope with the you know the block 
uh, sort of Bob Scott, because what we saw this last weekend, a bit of a different type of vibe with Evan Esbeth coming off and a couple of injuries and stuff like that. But, you know, Elwood Lowe came on to really good effect. Quaker Smith came on to really good effect. Um, and, and I think that they just didn't have anybody that was like that. They didn't have anybody that came off the bench and that was like, oh, sure, but like they've actually upped the ante here. Um, yeah. So I think that that's definitely a, a bit of a, a, a difference in depth. Absolutely. And Stevie, let's jump into our three awards that we always award after every single Springbok game. It's the Sergio Parisi Award, the player who is now undroppable going into the next game. It's the Boca 2016 Award, which is the highly droppable, droppable player player who hasn't had the best of games in the Carlos Spencer Award, the magic moment, the one that made everyone stand up and will, you know, live long on the highlights reels of all, all rugby, um, you know, fan pages to come. So let's start off with that Sergio Parise Award. We've got um, three nominations here. We've got Sasha, um, Aplele Fassi, and Yasu Visa. Um, let's start with Sasha, biggest game of his career by a country mile. <laughs> and he, you, can, you could say he stepped up. I mean, I, I think there was even a potential shot for him to be um, man of the match. He was a, possibly a little bit chaotic yeah. with the boot out of hand and in open play and maybe not as clinical and a little bit guilty of trying too much. But I think, to be honest, I think he's told to, he's been given that license. So yeah. you can't really criticize him for that. And I think that's what they want from him. But a hell of a performance. Yeah, look, he just looks so comfortable at this at this um, level. You know, kicked well. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, there's gonna be mistakes in this game. There's always gonna be mistakes. He's 22 years old, um, and again, he's trying things. You know, he's not. He doesn't always go the safe option, which we like. You know, at the end of the day, and there was a couple of kicks maybe in open play, which weren't great, and it kind of allowed us and opened us up a bit at times. So, but every single mistake he's gonna make, he's gonna say, "Shit, okay, I can't do that again." You know, so the experience we're building into him here is so invaluable. And at the end of the day, a bit like when Mike Ebok was playing last year, we just seem to be a better side because he's playing in it. And I think yeah. that's that's the main exactly. thing. Um, so, yeah, I thought he looked so comfortable exactly. once again. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so cool to, to see him just keep getting better. As is Apple Fassi, because I spoke about last week, Apple Fassi, I said he's been really good so far this year. But against tier two nations, if we're going to be brutally honest, um, you know, Portugal and, and a weak Australian yeah. side. And this was finally the big test for Apple FS, as well as the Welsh side as well. And this was the big test. And he came through with flying colors. And I think for the first time, we can probably sit back and say, cool, we've, we've got, we, we're not worried about, you know, really to be moving on if there's any injuries, because you've obviously got Damien Phillips uh, And some people are going as far as to say that Damien Phillips doesn't, you know, will struggle to get back into the side, which I think is nonsense. Damien Phillips walks into the side tomorrow. But Fassi has become a genuine option at fullback, which, which is really good to see. And also a very different player too. They really, Damien and Apolele all bring something very, very different. But yeah, to echo what you said, what a game from him. Kicking, dynamism, um, just the way he took the ball to the line, created for others. It was almost a hybrid of of Vili and Damien. So I'm looking for him. And then, of course, we managed seeing Jasper Visa come back from his stand, back like he never left, just physically so strong, um, you know, meters past the contact line, and he's just an absolute plus and brought such an energy that we missed in that number eight position. Um, and it's, you know, Evan Rose is now out of the squad, but Eric Lowe was, you know, he had been decent there and came on decently, but what a man. Um, Stevie, who gets your vote? I'm going Jasper. Um, I think that we were waiting to see who was going to put their hand up after 20th minute. I think we saw two games from Evan Rose. We've seen a couple of games from Quaker Smith. We saw a game from Eric Lowe, and none of them were abysmal you know there was never terrible games but you know never really sort of anybody that went oh okay there we go and i thought he came in and within 44 minutes firmly said yeah listen guys this number is mine like it's nice me. try yeah no absolutely i i agree i think that's that's the fair he is the most undroppable and he, by virtue of that earns yeah. the Sergio Parisi award. Oh, based on that so, game i think you know if there's one person who yeah. walked into that game and you look back and you go we're not changing it it was him yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, Jasper Visa, well then you get the Sergio Parise Award. The Boca 2018 Award, the one you really want to avoid, and there are two names that we have um, that have earned the nomination, unfortunately, and one was Quibbish Runoff, the other one was Ben Jason Dixon, obviously the latter now, getting substituted at half time 
and yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts because we are massive Ben Jason Dixon stands. Yeah, um, so so he's just posted on Instagram. I think it was today actually. And uh, this is what he had to say. He said, honored to have been part of another hard fought victory with the Bok Rugby this weekend. While the team came out on top, I know I didn't have my best game out there, but that's part of the journey. Every match is a chance to learn, grow, and come back stronger. Grateful for my teammates, coach, and all the fans for the unwavering support. Excited to keep pushing forward and giving my all for this incredible team. My guy. We love him. We do yeah, love him. No. If you have any doubts, just just back back the lad. Look, I mean, I mean, to be fair, I don't think it was an appalling game. Um, I felt sorry for. I think I think the offload was was, was pretty poor. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 again, it's a combination of mistakes as well. To be fair, a combination of errors that kind of lead up to it. Um, so yeah, I felt for him, but you know, it wasn't his best game. He'll be back, and he'll play many games for the Springboks as well. I've got no doubt about that. Um, again, this is kind of what you get with the eating spirits. You get people who are eager to impress, and they kind of make sometimes can make these these mistakes, which yeah. you have to allow them to do. At at uh, when they when they're this young, Kubis Rana, I think for me, <sighs> frustrating game. Um, I just feel that he's just not bringing anything particularly good to the table at the moment. You know, his, his distribution is fine. For example, I don't feel he he uh, he controlled the game as well as as we'd like him to to do. Uh, he doesn't bring the same sort of rush defense and the defense prowess that a Fafta Clerk brings. Um, and I just thought he was it was a bit of a forgettable for performance from him. Yeah. No, I agree. It's it's he does the job, but you don't end up often speaking about it after the game for the right types of reasons. Be like, she that mm. was something new. You you know, I think also from a defensive point of view, you, to an extent, you know what to expect from him, and maybe that's kind of also the job that he's been given. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't inject anything like that real. real um, I think my nomination still has to go, unfortunately, to Ben Jason. I think it's going to be harder for him to earn his way back into the side. So for me, as much as he is a boy, you, you've got to give, um, I think, that honest um, feedback. And it sounds like he's willing to accept that as well. So I don't know. He gets my vote. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think I agree. Uh, I mean, you, got, you got pulled at half time, basically, or before half time. Um, so a tough day in the office. Uh, although, ironically, I wouldn't be surprised if he were to still start this weekend. And I also wouldn't be surprised if Corvus Ronald does get dropped because a certain Jaden Hendricks is back in the mix. And I think that he was I was watching on Saturday. I was just sitting there thinking a lot of the time, this game is so set up for Jaden Hendricks in terms of a tactical scrum off. He just reads the game, knows when to slow it down, can read the situation very well and, and can play what's in front of him. Um, you know, and I think him well, and him and Grant Williams complement each other really well. I think we then we need hmm? to change the nomination because that that doesn't agree with what we're going with. Is who's more likely to get dropped? So I think this goes for. Yeah, but to be fair though, I, I don't think it's necessarily performance based as opposed to availability by the players based. Okay. Because okay, PSF okay, well, yeah, can't really. Stick with Ben Jason Dixon and but yeah, you know, little caveat there. <laughs> Lastly, the Carlos Spencer Award magic moment to highlight real. For me, I've I've added two in. You, I've added three, and you've added two. My one was the Chasey Colby bump off on um good old scotty barrett just that bounce is unbelievable how he generates that much force and gets us low to down to these people i think it's also because these big guys have to get so low and almost yeah. they, they, have, they end up being on their heels um a little bit so he just manages to say cheers i'll see you later um, but it's ridiculous how he's able to generate that much force. Then Ulrich Lowe, just those two takes off the yeah, off taking the names. Let's kick off. I said, oh, was dirty. Um, who did he send? Was it Mark Tillier? But it was it was Mark was Tillier. That? Um, it was Mark Tillier. Yeah. He sent him flying, and Mark Tillier is to everyone else. So that was ridiculous. And and again, you know, a lot of memes coming out of that one. And then obviously it has to. Be for me, the last one was that Sasha Sasha sixty meter kick. Just the balls on this guy to take that on and take it or call for it, take it, hit it over, and act like it's you know not a big deal. It's ridiculous. Um, this kid. But I want to hear your your two Quata Smith and, and Grant Williams nomination. Yeah, I think maybe more, maybe more all around performance. Obviously, those two were the tries. You know, Grant Williams scoring the final try. Um, yeah. But I thought Cocker Smith once again kind of came on and just affected the game so much. You know, a couple of turnovers where he's ripping the ball in the tackle and and things like that. And just yeah, I thought the try. I thought his try turned the game. 
you know, obviously Grant Williams' try won the game, but I felt that that moment, that try yeah. um, was the turning point. I think that broke the back of the All Blacks, and I think you, you kind of felt once he scored, we were going to win. You know, it was that kind of moment yeah. where I suddenly felt well, for the first felt time, to actually, win no, this is our game. Name and... Yeah, I felt similar to when Achilles Neyman scored that try versus England. You know, then it was inevitable. Like, finally, mm. you know, you've broken the deadlock and it's 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 coming now. It's just you need to click. Um, so on reflection, Stevie, who gets your um, man of the match? Oh, sorry, the, the the magic moment, the Carlos Spencer magic moment. I'm probably between. I mean, I, I mean, I love the Sasha kick. Um, I really did. I'm probably between Cheslin and and Quaker Smith in terms of a first of all, like just the the actual the, the raw power to sit down Scott Barrett. There's also the All Black captain, so there's a certain amount of yeah, just makes it so much t- tough tough times there. Um, but I also <laughs> I think Quaker Smith is probably my favorite moment of the game in terms of that was when I felt cool. Now we we got this. Yeah. Um, so I'm between those I two. Think, so you can have the you can have I the think, swing vote on on those two unless you have unless you have a justification for any of the other ones. No, I think I think this vote should always be in ten years' time. Which one is more likely going to be replayed? And for me, that's Cheslin Colby, like that that yeah. bounce. As you said, on an All Black captain, you know, a tiny number eleven versus or number fourteen versus you know the massive number five. It's just it's <laughs> it's iconic, and it's exactly what rugby you expect in the other way around. And Cheslin Colby just continuing to prove the world that. <laughs> Not what you always assumed he was. So he, I think he gets our vote. So Sergio Parisi, the undroppable award goes to Yasper Visa. The Boca 2016, highly droppable award, Ben Jason Dixon. And Carlos Spencer, magic moment, goes to Chesden Colby. Um, let's go into the Curry Cup, Stevie. And um, your Golden Lions are sitting right on top of the table with mm. one week to go before the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. So just to fly through this before we move on to uh, the, the, some of the other sports stuff like that. Um, so this past weekend we had uh, the Greek was beating Cheers forty four points to thirty one, a big upset for them. Kind of showing they're not going to make the players, but showing that they're still a team to be reckoned with. Um, the Bulls going down at Michigan College to the Lions fifty seven thirty three. It was a very strong Lions side. Not that to say there weren't some decent Bulls players, given the fact that you know Kenny Moody was starting at fifteen. Um, you had Jakob van der Valt, who's an international cap at, at 10. So, then, for example, there were more international caps on the Bulls side and then the Lions side. Um, but a very good result for the Lions, who I think at this stage are now putting themselves into firm favorites for, for that Curry Cup. Uh, the mm-hmm. Sharks hammering the Griffins 75 points to 19. And Western Province getting a rare win at the Donny Craven Stadium over at the Pumas. Um, although pretty yeah. much a win in vain because mm-hmm. the top four is all but decided going into this weekend. But there is virtually a quarterfinal, which is very exciting. So at the moment, the yeah. uh, log is... Uh, the Lions on top with 38 points. They play the Griffins on Friday, so you expect them to keep that top position and should have a home semi-final. You then got Bulls uh, taking on, uh, sorry, the Bulls at 37 in, in the second place. You got Sharks in third with 31, um, who are well ahead and can't be caught by the Cheetahs and the Pumas. So you kind of feel that the top three probably basically already confirmed given the Lions game that they've got. Um, Sharks can only get within a point of uh, of the Bulls, but also can't be caught by the Cheetahs. However, the Cheetahs and the Pumas currently sit at four and five, just one point separating them, and the Pumas, one point behind the Cheetahs, will be hosting them this weekend. So this weekend will be the Greek was taking on Western Province on Friday at three o'clock. Lions taking on Griffins at quarter past five. You then got Pumas hosting the the, the Cheetahs at half past one on Saturday. Watch that game. That's the game to watch. Um, and then you've got Sharks versus Bulls at 3 o'clock, which is a nice little precursor to uh, the game happening on uh, uh, this evening in, in Cape Town. And uh, yeah, and then obviously the rugby championship one. I think just to mention, obviously, uh, didn't have, we didn't have time to talk about it, but Australia going beating Argentina by one point has meant the rugby championship is very much um, on the verge of, of South Africa in terms of those games this weekend. It is South Africa versus New Zealand, 5 o'clock Saturday, same time, same place. Nine o'clock this time for Argentina versus Australia. A bit of a more friendly time than the midnight kickoff last weekend. Dan, footy, Premier League. It is. Let's talk about it. it back. TV. Yeah, let's let's, let's go through the hard yards here. Yeah. Of tears. Uh, yeah, I, I finished my Sunday as good as I could have asked, and it was a lovely three 0 win for uh, the United. Schlotty ball is in full force and Ten Hag ball is looking a little bit weary. Um, I want to know from your perspective, Stevie, 
what do you think in the backing on Ten Hag? Obviously, we're only three games in. It's super early. And you know, you hate to jump to conclusions so early on in the season. But I want to speak a lot about United's identity and what a lot of people are saying, lack of identity. Are you picking that up or are you still a believer and you just think it's a bit of, bit of a tough start to the season? Because if you look at the face of it, you've got a late um, winner to, or late-ish winner to win your first game. Lost the second to Brighton. Quite a tough game, but, you know, losing that in the dying moments. And then quite a convincing loss now against Liverpool. Um, yeah, what, what are you saying for Ten Hag's future and this identity that is um, either forming or lax? Yeah, look, I think I think the idea of a lack of identity can sometimes be um, a bit of a lazy analysis. You know, a, a bad identity or a bad game plan, for example, doesn't mean it isn't one. Um, you know, so I think the biggest issue we're seeing is is a game plan where the midfield is, is just not up there. Um, whether yeah, it's something that gets fixed with a new signing, for example, in regards to coming on, we we, we wait and see. But you can just see yes, there's a systematic issue um, which 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 is happening at the moment, and tactically we've just not been been where we're at. Uh, look, it is early days. You know, we are three games into the season. Um, taking four out of possible nine points is not ideal. We go back two seasons, for example, um, into his first season, and he lost his first two games uh, to I think it was Brighton to Brentford, um, and then beat Liverpool two. <laughs> so it, it's a long season ahead, um, and I think that. So what's you know, his timeline looking is, like? You think? Well, what? What? Well, the problem is. He, he he backed him, so they've they've come out and they've backed him before. They've given him a new a, a new a new contract, so you can't sack him after two losses, you know, because um, then you should never have backed him. If you if no, you're that on the not, fence about not. him, no, then you should never have backed him in the first place. Yeah, uh, but do do you think he's given it the season? Is that a guarantee, or is Christmas there going to be a, a review period if you kind of you know sitting in a spot where top fours are looking unlikely? Yeah, look, I think I think the fact is, as well, you've got Ruud van Nistelrooy, who's kind of in the setup, who's got manager experience. A lot of people reckon that he's that kind of the contingency plan. Um, I don't think he's necessarily got the season. I think if, if results slide, then I think that they will make a change and they will make a change before Christmas if things aren't going to go well because we can't afford to have another season where we're not, you know, competing uh, on on all, uh, and, and getting near that top four. You know, top four has yeah. to be the priority. So as soon as that yeah. becomes a, exactly. a problem, then you've got to get, him, get rid of him. Exactly. Last season was like one of those poor seasons, but you got the FA Cup, so it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll allow that. That's a nice gloss on it. But that's only if there's progress. We Top four will always be selected nowadays over FA Cup. Um, but yeah, and then another big one, Arsenal dropping points. Um, what, what do you think about taking right straight card? Was that completely intended, kicking the ball away? Or, you know, is he, is he, a, you know, is he a guilty man or is he not a guilty man? Well, I think he is guilty. I don't think any Arsenal fans are trying to say he's not. I think the issue that they have is obviously Jao Pedro also kicked the ball away in the first half, so there's inconsistencies. At the end of the day, it is something that, by the rule book, is technically a yellow card. Um, you know, it's it's an annoying yellow card. It's an annoying red card, and you can see why there's the reaction. Um, by the letter of the law, for example, it, it, it is a red card. I think he does mean to do it. I think yeah. you're a football. You have a football at your feet. You know, twenty four seven. You know where the ball is. You know what you're doing. Yeah, um, yeah. You understand the frustration, but um, and the last, the, the thing is, it's, there's precedent out there. So now, so now we know. Now, you, and and that's kind of the idea, isn't it? He does it. They're trying to cut it out. He gets a red card. No one's going to do it again this season. Exactly. No, I agree. I think he's, he he has intended it, and he realizes that his mistake straight away. And he, you know, obviously he got hoofed as a result of it, and so he was. Yeah, in the sense, um, but it didn't, didn't help him with that. And yeah, I mean, a, a big result for Brighton, who are out for blood this season, it seems, as they have been for the last couple. Um, some other notable results, Chelsea won one draw with Palace. Who knows what we're going to get out of that box of this season. Um, and then a big win for Newcastle, who won over Spurs at home. Um, and of course, um, City beating um, West Ham 3-1. I mean, Kudus could have drawn it up hitting the post there, which would have been 2-2. Haaland getting a hat-trick, so two in a row, 2-2 two, two games. And that takes him to 70 goals in 69 games. And I really wanted to hear from you, Steve. Is he completely disrespected as possibly the best ever Premier League signing? 
Well, it's becoming hard not to be considered that, to be honest. Um, and Shane, there are so many content creators who all said that he was going to flop and he wasn't going to have the same numbers and he has. And it's turning the Premier League into a bit of a mockery, isn't it? Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, he is playing in the best team in the Premier League by quite some margin. And I think, you know, it's also a very interesting time where um, a lot of the, the Premier League teams haven't been as, as strong, especially even across the board, as maybe they have been before. Um, especially now, for example, you've got so many teams going through these transitions. I mean, you've got how many new managers, you know, you've got Chelsea, new manager, uh, United, um, uh, you know, in a bit of a turmoil, you've got Liverpool with a new manager, you've got, you know, so many, so many different things happening in around the Premier League at the moment. So it's an interesting, yeah, yeah, you know, um, so it's, uh, so, I mean, but at the the end of the day, you know, I mean, he does that pat to surgery. He is one of those people, he, when he plays against a, a week aside, he just bangs so many goals. It's it's frightening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can't take away the, the numbers speak for themselves. You know, he's he's just a different level. No, I completely agree. It it he, uh, me, he's one of those where he doesn't rep. And this might sound harsh, but he doesn't represent the beautiful game. I don't think he's like one of those. He's yeah. not a streets won't get type of player. He's clinical. And he's not he's robotic. You know, he just gets the job done. He goes to work, yeah. he scores a hat trick and he leaves. And it's not um, you know, step overs, bicycle kicks, but geez, he just knows how to put the ball in the corner. So, you know, the likes of when other people score goals, I think it's almost more exciting because it's done in more creative ways. Whereas he it's just De Bruyne a ridiculous ball onto the forehead or counter attack bang, two touch goal. Like he's just so clinical. So um, credit where credit's due. He's he's just the, the master of putting the ball in the back of the net. But Stevie, that's an international break now, and so let's move on to the cricket. And we've had SAA take on Sri Lanka A um, in in the only real South African action uh, this week. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting tour, for example, and uh, it has been quite. I mean, it's always an interesting thing. You know, what is the purpose of the SAA tour? Now, some people are very results-driven. I'm performance-driven. I want to see who's standing up. I want to see which, you know, players are going to put their hands up and put them into contention to be um, in, the, in that ODI side. And we're building towards 2027 World Cup, which is here. So we've got three years to try and build a, a, a World Cup winning team. Um, so personally, I don't really care about the results. We have lost both games. Maybe that comes across a bit sour. We, I mean, we got hammered in the first game, lost by 93 runs. Um, yesterday was, was by, lost by 30 runs, a bit of a better game. But we have seen a lot of rotation. So, for example, in the first ODI, um, notable performances from a bowling perspective. Uh, Tristan Luz took the most wickets. Um, we joined with Andila Petlaqua. Petlaqua was very economical as well, which was nice to see. Um, Ethan Bosch also having two wickets there. Um, but uh, from the from the bank perspective, Tony Dzorzi got a fifty. Uh, Brevis got a got a thirty nine uh, as well. Did kind of run out Tony Dzorzi, and I think that was kind of where the things uh, uh, you know kind of went uh, barely yeah. up. But Ethan Bosch contributed with the bat. Uh, Miki El Prince we'll talk about as well. Now he responded very nicely in the second ODI. Somebody who actually wasn't supposed to be in the squad altogether um, has has stepped up. Matthew Breska, by the way, is captaining the side. And and the second ODI, which is a much better performance, yes, there's a couple of players dropped out, no Dezorzi, no Brevis. Um, mm. But Mikael Prince got uh, 44, 46. Nice innings from him. Breska stepped up with a 74. Mutasami contributed with a 37. But nice to see a bit of a tail wag. Um, Andida Petla Choir, 24 of 18. And Andida Similani, by the way, has just come off the back of uh, scoring a first-class century against... Um, Zim in that, in that sort of SAA tour or emergent tour, I think it was an SAA tour uh, yeah. or an emergent tour, whatever it was, over in Zim. Um, he actually scored a century and and took some wickets over there. He was probably the find yesterday in terms of that that 27 of 20, 135 strike rate before contributing with the ball as well with um, some some decent numbers as as well. So yeah, I think the main thing for me is who's stepping up in these in these games um, and. Really, really chuffed to see that we are seeing a couple of players like a um, Similani step up, for example. Brieska scoring runs, you know, I think he's somebody who should be involved in the team. Yeah. Um, going forward. Great ODI pair. It's, it's, yeah. Like he's had a bit of a crack at T20 and he could still be there, but I'd love to see him. He's obviously been in the test squad, but I think ODI really suits him well. He's learned how to really accelerate his game in his T20 performances, but also just such good technique. I think he can bat for long, long instances. So, 
yeah, decent and looking forward to the next couple of games there. Hopefully this um, momentum shift can continue to turn around. Um, and as you say, it's just it's about getting access and knocking the door down of, um, you know, who's going to get that next protest caller. But let's talk about the um, the new format for SA Schools. And it's the SA20 that has taken a new shape or an additional shape um, in branching out to the school system, Stevie, for men and women. How exciting mm. is that? And walk us through exactly how that's going to work. Yeah, I think that for me, the big thing is obviously the, the men's and women's. Um, so it's going to be, um, I think there's, there's a lot of schools involved. I think you've got over 500 schools that are involved. Um, 376 teams for the boys, 219 for the girls. Um, and it's going to be very interesting. So basically, phase one is provincial, kind of as you'd imagine. Um, so you basically will have, it's basically, be, I think my understanding is within the school league. So for example, I know my um, old school is is currently being reviewed. It's apparently they've got very stringent conditions as to if you could get to compete, you have to have certain facilities and certain things and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, apparently I'm trying to find more information mm-hmm. about that, but apparently it is quite um, uh, hectic in terms of, of what they did, but I'm hoping that there'll be a lot of money available down the line if you can kind of get yourself in the system. But uh, basically, it'll be 16 regions across uh, the, the two divisions. Um, there are going to be 558 matches in the boys' division, 358 in the girls' division, um, a combined player base of almost 8,000 youngsters. Um, and, uh, you know, this is all going to be at first team level, for example. So this is all sort of, um, you know, your 17, 18, 16 year olds type of thing. After that, it then goes to phase two, which is regional. There'll be 32 teams in the boys, and there will be uh, 16 teams for the girls. And uh, then in phase three, um, it is going to be a national finals, basically, which will be 22 matches. And um, there'll be different uh, uh, sort of uh, different regions that we're representing. So, for example, there'll be eight boys teams, six girls teams. Obviously, there's obviously nine. Um, provinces so in terms of the um the 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 boys teams there'll be western cape team eastern cape team KwaZulu natal then there'll be central which will be northern cape free state northwest there'll be Gauteng south which is in pumalanga and lions and Gauteng north which is titans and popo and easterns then there's going to be a csa hub select 11 and a boys focus school um it'll be exactly the same for the girls minus the no boys focus school and no csa hubs select 11 so that is the format um, I mean, this is going to be massive for, 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 for school crickets. I mean, you talk about a pipeline, for example, and now, you know, to have every year 7,000 players being on a scouting radar. It's massive. This is going to revolutionize cricket if we can get it right. Absolutely. I think it's so exciting to see us finally put, I feel like, more grassroots structures in place. This is, isn't definitively grassroots. It's more just like access to schools, but it's just signing a spotlight on how people and talented cricketers um whether male or female can see that path to becoming professional because the more people we have in that system the more people we can get behind it the more money is going to be in the game and it's just going to improve um the sport as a whole so really excited for that um two quick touching points before we get into the paralympics is a massive win for both south africa's alan hatherley who won the uci mountain bike world champs beating the two people that beat him at the olympics in um, Vicky Koretsky from France, as well as Tom Pitcock. Um, so a massive win for him in, in Andorra and a first um, world championship for Alan Hathi. So he continues his hot streak. And then Tony McCann winning the UTMB um, trail event, the most prestigious trail event. She won the 66K, 55K, excuse me, last year. And as a result of which, you can choose the next race you enter into. She entered the 100K, her first ever competitive 100K race, and then just go out and wins the whole field. I think won by a couple minutes. But seeing her come in, she is an absolute beast and kind of now joins a very select few women who have are all trying to become the first to win the 55, 100, and 160. So she said she's not going to quite ramp it up there yet because given that this was her first ever 100K race, but that is something that we can only hope for in the future. And we just a massive, um, you know, waving the flag high, which we love to celebrate here. Um, speaking of waving the flag high, Stevie, we have two medals in the Paralympics mm-hmm. in week one. And that's Kumlelo Nklongo, um, as well as Luzon Kutsia. And 
two of the people we said to, to look out for. So look at us just preaching. And yeah, look, I mean, we are, we are, we are, we're prophetic at the end of the day. Exactly, exactly. So Mpumle and Mplongo winning the 100 meters T44 race in a time of 11-12. The world record is 10-8-1. And he's actually said that he's running so well this season that, you know, he actually really wants to get below that 11 second barrier and even try to get towards that. So an absolute masterclass from him. He has um, world records of his own. He has world champions of his own, but this is his first ever Olympic medal. So an unbelievable performance. And he is just an incredible sportsman. Um, at the age of 30, he's peaking in his sprinting career. And was, you know, again, as we spoke about in the Olympics, you just need to hear that anthem, um, you know, ring around the stadium. And now yeah. we've had it in the Stade de France as a result of him. So big up and pull little. Yeah, and, and so cool to see him a, a flag bearer, for example, live up to the stage because, you know, exactly. you've, you've, you've seen the stage, you expect to deliver, and he did deliver. Exactly. Um, so, went yeah, ma- massive favorite. big ups to him. Yeah, went in as yeah. a favorite and delivered. We said that. We like having favorites. It's not all. We don't always want to be the underdog. Let's be the favorite and win as well. Um, the next one went to Lazan Kutsia. She secured our second medal at the Paralympics with the bronze in the T11 um, 1,500-meter final. She is blind and runs with a guide um, who is um, Badenhorst, and they've been running together. I think this is their second Olympics. And so they've, this, she actually won gold in this in the last Olympics. She has now won bronze in an unbelievable, a personal best for her. She's quoted saying, I'm not going anywhere. I still want to break um, you know, another couple seconds off my time. And later on this Olympics, just to, in case she was, wasn't, this wasn't enough, she's going to run the marathon. And she came third in that in the last Olympics. So maybe she can just flip it around. You know, this time she'll get gold in the marathon. So Zan, what an absolute beast. Bring home some more records. We absolutely love to see it. Um, another couple notable mentions were um, to Makote, who finished fifth in the T63 100-meter final with a time of 12 seconds, 16. Um, a fantastic effort from him. There's not quite enough to get into that spot. And then we have... Um, What's it called? We have two coming up. Nathan Hendricks um, placed eighth in the men's 200 meter final um, and it, it, in the SM13 category with a time of 2.18.36. And he is going to the final as well as Christian Sadi, who finished sixth in the men's 100 meter backstroke, S7 in the heat one. And he too is onto the final. So finals and coming. Yeah, everyone. and also big, big, big thing for tonight is we've got uh, two women in the 400 meter T37 final in Liesl Hals and Cheryl James. So amazing. And two, when you got two, when you got two people in there, you can you can medal medal suddenly become a lot uh, more likely. Exactly, exactly. Always like having two two people in the pool to possibly um you know grip that um that the, the those medals for us. And what's been lovely to see and similar to the Olympics is how well the um the records have been broken but african records we continue to see personal bests and it's unbelievable how um these people are stepping up on the biggest stage and delivering if you deliver a personal best at the paralympics or the olympics you can't ask for anything more that is unbelievable and so although people may not be winning at, at this point they are still getting personal best which is always incredible to see but it's finished Let's wrap up this episode, Stevie, with the predictions as we always do. And it's going to be all out rugby because there's not much cricket. We don't really want to do anything on international football because who cares? And then there are blockbuster rugby games. So why the hell not? And we're going to do the Springbok Correct. All Blacks, Argentina versus Australia, and Pumas versus the Cheetahs. Let's start with the big one in Cape Town Box versus All Blacks. Yeah. Um, do you have a prediction in mind? I do. All right. Okay. That's not a while. Okay. I'll kind of say it. Okay. Three, two, one. Box by Box seven. Box by four. We've, gone. Yo, we've, we've reversed. Yeah. We've reversed. I'm more confident. I'm more confident. Is it? Yeah. I... What a bad feeling is going to be a backlash. Oh, dear. No, Freedom Cup is absolutely coming home. It has to. <laughs> It has to. <laughs> it's coming home. Yeah, I know. I, we can't. We can't go. This is it now. We, we're not getting a better chance to win it. Oh my gosh! Uh, it, it will be like I don't know. It, it will just be one of those things. I think we'll be cursed if we can't win this Freedom Cup finally back. Correct. Um, but 
Correct. Let's go off to Argentina versus Australia. Do you have a score in mind for that, Stevie? I do. So do I. You, I'll let you count to seven. Gosh. Three, two, one. Argentina, Argentina by, by 10. Whoa. Nice. Got to, they, surely they've got to bounce back. Surely. Well, I don't. I still, I still to this day, I cannot understand how they managed to lose that game. I mean, at one stage they were looking so comfortable, so good. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't understand. I, yeah, I did, beggars belief how they threw that away <laughs> at home, especially. So I think also, there'll be a um, because I think if they had managed to kind of stay competitive in that and then won it, the the box visiting them would have been for the title. They would have been in with a shout there. Yeah. Um, and now they I mean, literally, uh, uh, like two weeks, we, I mean, I, I, I think it was in the first half, we were talking about, oh, Arsenal actually be our dark horse potentially win the rugby championship because of how they, well they were playing. And then they went and lost the game. Yeah. And you kind of go, not, hmm. a good look. not a good look. Um, and then what are we calling the unofficial quarterfinal of the Curry Cup? Yeah. Pumas, cheaters, Pumas at home, which could be. Um, Steve, have you got a score in mind there? Yeah, this is such a difficult one. Um, these teams, both of them, have been so inconsistent this season. It's actually mental. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I do, I do, I do, I do, I do have a score. Do you have one? I do. I do. I'm ready when you are. You can't descend. Okay. I'll kind of send. Okay. Three, two, one. Cheaters by ten. By ten. You say by ten. Yeah. I say by two. It doesn't sound like you were you were thinking about that too much. <laughs> I guess Curry Cup. It, it, so the problem is, is, it, is by ten in the Curry Cup. <laughs> yeah, to, to be fair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be fair, I mean, tried. even like the Bulls at one stage looked like stage a comeback against the Lions, and the Lions ended up winning by like twenty five points. And like, what comeback? Like, I, but it's just yeah. the problem is that the Pumas have just been. I mean, at once, I mean, they drew to the Sharks, for example. They beat the Lions. Um, but they've also been hammered a couple of times as well and, and had some weird results. Uh, mm-hmm. Who knows which teams, are, and she is as well. I mean, she was one stage you were thinking, oh, well, they usually favors the Curry Cup because of the, the quality of the team, and then they've just lost some silly games. So the Curry Cup's just taking no prisoners at the moment. No, it's not. It's not. I think just that, that Curry Cup heritage sits a bit more for me in big clutch games for the Chiefs than it does for the Pumas. That's why they get my but, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happens the other way around. Yeah. Um, but Stevie, yeah, what an episode! Episode thirty-three next mm. week. All the viewers, you'll see me in the the shirt that I want to wear least in this world, and it, I'm sure it'll make a lot of people very, very happy. So for that, I am incredibly sad. Um, but yeah, well, now let's you know what? Just note. just predict better, dude. Yeah, at the end of the day. No, well, I have, and I and I'm confident in that. You know. um, <laughs> well. but, yeah, we'll go, we'll go, going forward, I, I don't intend on losing another one of these, that's for sure. Having started with an, going down, I think, 8-2 in the beginning, I learned my lesson very quickly. So yeah. that was unfortunately, an understandable feed that you had. But Stevie, thank you for the episode. Jeepers, we've got an exciting um, weekend ahead, particularly, obviously, on the rugby side. Um, and, of course, following the stars who hopefully step up in the SAA for the cricket. And then we can just take a bit of a breather with the Premier League football and gather ourselves as much as I would kill just to watch us continue going as a Liverpool fan right now. Thank you, yeah. everyone, for watching. Please do share, like, and um, subscribe to this um, Between Two Fans podcast. We really do appreciate all of the support. And if it's something that you think a friend of yours will enjoy, appreciate, or if it's just a Man United fan that you need to let them know that there's another one of them out there who, who's suffering just like you. Or if it's a Liverpool yeah, fan. We'll be suffering enjoying, again. We've got support groups. Yeah. If it's a Liverpool fan enjoying uh, Schlotty Ball. Either one of those, send it to them and we appreciate your support. TV, thank you very much. Like it. Yeah. And everybody else, we'll see you guys next time. Cheers.